Hello there. This is a recorded session for you on the 12 and 20 mark questions in your A-level geography exam and how you approach them every time to gain maximum marks using the content and knowledge you have to make sure that you are reaching those maximum marks. So first of all, on the right hand side there, there is a little grid that shows you what types of questions and how many marks those questions are worth that you can be asked in your A-level exam. So we are ignoring the AS ones and we're only looking at the AL ones. And so you can see that for A-level, we get these 18, 20 and 24 markers, the 18 and the 24 markers being in paper three, whereas in paper one and two of your A-level, you will mainly get 12 and 20 mark questions, but you will also have some four mark questions, some six mark and some eight mark questions as well. There is also some three mark questions, as you can see here, where AL is in explain, but these questions are mainly resource based, very short, and they will ask you to identify something from a resource and explain it. Now, in terms of our 12 and 20 mark questions in the A-level, there are only two command words you need to be aware of, and you should already be aware of this. So there is 12 mark questions, which will always ask you to assess, both in the physical and human side of the course. And there are 20 mark questions, which will always ask you to evaluate. Now, students often confuse the meaning of assess and evaluate. So assess means you're creating arguments to find out or determine how important something is. So you may have three different factors and you have to decide which is most important, which is somewhat important, and which is least important. Whereas a 20 mark evaluate question is about coming to a decision or a verdict based on evidence you provide, which agrees or disagrees with what you're asked about. So the difference here being that evaluate is actually debating the issues, having a conversation in your exam answer about the issues, giving different sides of the argument, and then making a decision. In assess questions, you don't really make decisions. You just put them in order of most important, somewhat important, and least important. So this session is going to explore how to structure 12 mark and 20 mark questions and how to make sure that that structure every time allows you to identify and gain as many marks as possible. So for 12 mark questions, the key way you can gain maximum marks in a 12 mark question is by doing two things. Use the you backer process on screen and also always use peel paragraphs. So you should already know what peel paragraphs are. You make a point, you explain that point in detail, you give evidence from a case study or an example to back up what you've said, and you link back to what the question asks in the first place. Now the UBacker process, which is specific to the Samuel Whitbread Academy sixth form, is essentially looking at the things that a good 12 mark answer includes. So it will have a good understanding of geographical theory and reasons. It will have balance between the arguments. It will say what the most important argument is, what somewhat is important and what's least important. It will have accurate reasons, accurate case study examples. It will try to make connections between the factors in some way that you're talking about. It will have good in-depth knowledge from your case studies and from your own geographical knowledge. It will give evidence from those case studies and examples, and it will use data or figures or dates. And finally, it will relevantly answer the question. So it will link back to the question at the end of each paragraph, showing you are answering that question. So for these 12 mark questions then, Again, the command word being assess only. Assessing content means you are formulating arguments and ranking them into most important, somewhat important, and least important. And you will do one paragraph for each of those. So one paragraph for most important, one paragraph for somewhat important, 
and one paragraph for least important. So most important is the argument you feel is the strongest factor. It is the argument you think is most important. It might have the most impact. Somewhat important then is an argument you feel is still important, but not as important as the one you have previously made. And finally, least important then is the argument you feel is not important as much as the other two. It doesn't have a major impact um, or effect on whatever the factor is you are talking about. And it's almost the least relevant in this sense. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to run you through the typical structure for a 12 mark question that you should follow. So you start off with your introduction. Now, your introduction depends on the question you're asked. Most introductions should define the main key term in the question, the main geographical term that's used, and it should name the factors or list the content that you are going to explore. In other words, introduce the ideas you're going to talk about. The introduction should be quite short. For a 12 mark question, you're looking at maximum six lines. You shouldn't really be explaining very much in your introduction, just defining and setting out what you are going to do. Now, the first paragraph, as we mentioned before, is the most important factor. So it should start with the most important. They are the words you should use to start this paragraph. So it might be, for example, the most important factor is um, migration or the location of a volcano. You would then explain what that means. So explain what you are referring to in as much detail as you can from your own knowledge. And then you bring in an example to support that explanation. So, for example, if you're talking about migration, you would bring in a migration flow, for example, for uh, Mexicans to North America and the USA would be a migration flow or Polish people to the UK is another migration flow. Or if you're referring to the location of a volcano, you would bring in a specific volcano like Yafiafiokul in Iceland and the eruption that happened there. And finally, make sure in that use of the case study, you have statistics that are very specific, not made up, not approximate, as specific as you can be. So, for example, with that, you would not state there have been a lot of deaths. You would state that there have been 125,000 deaths. You would be very clear on that. And then you would end your first paragraph with the most important argument by saying, this is the most important factor overall because, and you would finish that sentence with the reason why this is the most important factor. You would then move on to your second paragraph. And in your second paragraph, you are arguing for what is still somewhat important. What is a somewhat important factor? So, for example, a somewhat important factor is, it may be for a, for a human topic, technology. It may be for a physical topic, the type of plate boundary found at a certain location. You would then explain what you mean by that factor. So for technology, for example, you might be talking about how technology has an impact on human development. So what exactly is that technology? What types of technology have had an impact on human development? You would then give an example of that factor from a case study, for example. So a type of technology flow or a type of technology like I, uh, super IT, like the Internet, like telephone communications. Or you might give a specific plate boundary. You might argue that because a certain volcano is on a constructive plate margin, that doesn't really play a role necessarily in having a high amount of deaths, but that also depends on location, going back to your most important paragraph. And again, you use statistics very specifically from that case study. You would end that paragraph by saying something along the lines of, this is a relatively important factor overall because, and then you would explain why it's somewhat important. You finish a 12 mark question by looking at the least important factor you believe to be the least important. So for example here, it could be wealth, it could be 
rural areas, for example, a volcano occurring in a rural area might be the least important factor that you're arguing about. So you explain that factor again from your own geographical knowledge in as much detail as you can. You then give an example of that factor. So for example, a country of lower wealth, if you're talking about wealth on the human side of the course, you may talk about a country that has lower wealth as an example. Or you might give a specific example of a rural volcano, such as Erfleetlioku in Iceland, which is a mainly rural country. And that may be one of the reasons why it has got limited impacts of volcanic eruptions, you could argue. Use again specific statistics and very specific facts from the case study or that example. And finally, to finish off this question, you would say overall, this is the least important factor because, and finish that sentence. And finally, with a 12 mark question, just to note, you do not need a conclusion. There is absolutely no need to write a conclusion because you do not need to make a decision on which factors are most important and why, again, you've already done so. So you do not need a conclusion in a 12 mark question. So that is the structure of a 12 mark question overall. They are the types of things you need to do with each pillar paragraph and you must, must follow the introduction, most important, somewhat important and least important. This is what an A-level examiner is looking for in your exam answers at the end of year 13. So I've just got some worked examples here for you. This one, for example, is for globalization. And the question was, assess the importance of technological advances as factors in accelerating globalization. So how important is technology in making accelerization, sorry, in making globalization go even faster? It's a pretty simple question, really, when you break it down. So you can see from my introduction, I would say globalization is the increasing interconnectedness of people around the world using technology and so on. Technological advances in globalization include, and then I have listed the three things I want to argue about. And they are transportation development, containerization, and ICT development. You can then see below, I've got my most important, somewhat important, and least important boxes. I have finished some of the sentences here for you. So the most important factor is transportation development. I then say what transportation is. What does it include? I then use an example. EasyJet is a low cost airline, which is a, both a product of and benefits from globalization. It allows for increasing accelerization of it from, and then you would explain how it allows for increasing acceleration. And then you give specific facts from that case study, such as EasyJet has 300 routes connecting global cities and has 65 million passengers annually. And that shows it is benefiting from globalization. That shows it has been really important in connecting people together. And then you finish the paragraph by saying, this is the most important factor overall because it has allowed for the most benefit of increasing interconnectedness and migration of people around the world, for example. You can then see there, I've got the two other paragraphs, which I'm not going to really read through, but you can see that I've argued about containerization and how that has increased goods and service movement. And I've also got specific statistics on that. And you can see that I've said ICT development is my least important, in my view, um, factor in accelerating globalization. However, I still have some statistics that do say it is important and it has played a role. So we're not saying that it's not important. It's just the least out of these three factors, in my opinion. Notice I have no conclusion. For a physical geography example here, we've got another 12 marker. And this one says, assess the importance of physical factors in explaining the impacts of volcanic eruptions. So how important are physical factors in explaining the impacts of volcanic eruptions. So you can see my introduction at the top there again, and I say volcanic eruptions are, and then I would finish that sentence by basically defining what a volcanic eruption is. And then I have said physical factors include plate tectonic boundaries, types of lava, and topography, which means the shape of the land. So move on to our most important factor I have said is the type of plate boundary. So plate boundaries are, you would explain what they are. Some plate boundaries cause significant impacts compared to others. 
So then you would say what a destructive plate boundary has done versus what a constructive might do. And then you would use your detailed example. For example, I have here said that the Haiti earthquake of 2010 was a severe destructive plate boundary with wide rating impacts such as, and then you would give some statistics like 300,000 deaths, for example. This again is the most important factor overall because, and you would finish that sentence. I then move on to my somewhat important paragraph and you can see that I have chosen to argue about types of lava. So lava types include, and you would list them. You then explain those types of lava and what impacts they have, as you can see I have done. And then you use an example again very specifically with those types of lava involved. Finally, my least important factor there is topography. I have said that the shape of a volcano and the shape of the landscape is the least important factor in determining the impact of a volcano. I've also related it to ash clouds and secondary impacts because the type of shape of a volcano can also enhance or not those impacts. And you can see I've used an example very clearly there of AF Lithiocal again. And you can see that I've said it costed over one billion, one billion pounds in European airspace in 2012 and so on. But I have said that the shape there is the least important factor in the physical factors explaining impacts of a volcanic eruption. So there are just some examples of how you might shape your answer. And essentially with that, you are showing very clearly to an examiner that you can decide most somewhat and least important and you can give evidence based on the explanation of what those things are. Again, no conclusion. So just to recap all of that, essentially what we're saying is you must categorize into most somewhat and least important, explain the factor as well as you can, use at least two case studies throughout your answer, at least two please, Give specific and accurate case study facts and statistics, don't make it up, and don't generalize. And finally, make sure you peel paragraph your answers throughout. And that will all lead you to a good level three answer. Now, let's move on to our 20 mark answers because they are very different, okay? Now, you can see a similar screen to what we started with earlier on. There is a difference though. This is not you backer. As you can see, there are more elements to this. And I've just put a star there beside the two elements that are also included over and above a 12 mark question for a 20 mark question. And you will see there that they are conclusion and argument. Now, conclusion, very simply, you must finish your 20 mark answer with a conclusion, which is a summary of everything you've said, along with a very, very rational and considered decision on which side is best or accurate. And also argument. You must have a balanced argument answer, which is for and against the question. So you must give detailed arguments for whatever is stated in the question and detailed arguments against whatever is stated in the question. Some key things about evaluate. Now evaluate means you are providing explanations and using evidence to make decisions. And you're making sure that the, you have balanced opposing views for and against, for and against. So you must provide an introduction which outlines the key terms and defines what your arguments are going to be, very much like a 12 mark question. You must debate and discuss the arguments throughout your answer. So you must give alternative or opposing views. You must have two paragraphs in favor or supporting or providing advantages. And you must have two paragraphs of on the other hand or however, which provide disadvantages or opposing views. And you must at the end come to a judgment or a conclusion paragraph, which makes a decision on which side has won the argument, in your opinion. You also have to be able to say why that side has won the argument. So let's have a look at a general structure for a 20 mark question then. 
Again, always using the key term evaluate. So with an introduction, again, you define the main key term or key terms, and you explain briefly what the ideas you are going to explore are. Start off the positive argument, for example. So you peer paragraph it, set out the positive point you want to make. In detail, explain that as much as possible. Try and use any theory you're aware of that you've done in lessons. We do a lot of theory in lessons. Try and use them and make links to as many ideas as you can. Use specific and detailed case study facts and explanation. And then at the end, link back. Why is this relevant? Why is it positive? Why is it a positive argument or why does it agree with what the question says? Now, you have a choice next. You can either do another positive argument paragraph or you can do a negative one. It doesn't matter what layout you do these in as long as you do two positive arguments or two agreeing arguments and two negative or disagreeing arguments. Now, I've decided in this case to show you a negative. So this literally starts with however or on the other hand. And you set out your opposing view then. So what do you want? What point do you want to make? Again, in detail, explain the point. Explain what you are talking about. Then give evidence from case studies again. And then go back to the question. Why is it negative? Why is it opposing? Why is this relevant? And then essentially, you repeat that process again. So as you can see on screen, we've got positive on the other hand, positive on the other hand. Now, as I said before, you can do positive, positive on the other hand, on the other hand, or you can do negative, negative, positive, positive. It's up to you. It doesn't really matter what way you do this as long as you have two positive arguments and two negative ones. And finally, that all important part of the 20 mark question is to make your decision, have a conclusion. Explain in that conclusion which side you're taking and why that's the strongest argument. Repeat your use of keywords where you can and start that conclusion with overall so that the examiner can clearly see you are about to come to your decision. So, Let's now have a look at some worked examples of this. Now, they're not extremely detailed, but you get the idea from looking at them as to what you would do in a 20 mark question. So here is a diverse places 20 mark example. And the question was, evaluate the statement. Population structures vary from place to place and over time. So population structures vary or change from place to place and over time. Now. In your introduction, you would define what population structures are. So what is population density, for example, and what is structure? You would define what place is. You might want to refer to the um, rural urban continuum, maybe. And also time. And this one's a hard one for a lot of students. One of the things you've looked at in terms of time is the demographic transition model and how countries over time move through different stages of their population structure so you could bring that into this type of question now again you can see my positive arguments and you can see my on the other hand arguments here so my first one my first positive argument is that population structures do vary so i'm agreeing with the question and are different in different places so then i explain how they vary what varies is there any theory I can bring in, such as the rural urban continuum, maybe? Then I would give evidence, and that is my case study. So I might use the Russian oligarchs idea in London. I might use Brick Lane. I might use Luton, for example. And then I would link back to the question. Why is this a positive argument? How does this agree with the question and statement? Population structures vary from place to place and over time. Now, you can see my second paragraph is on the other hand. And I've said, on the other hand, in some places, they do not vary much. So in some places, population structure doesn't really change. Now, if we try to explain that, we can use the rural urban continuum here. And we can say that rural areas in the same position, away from the city centre, don't really have major differences. 
and we could use East Devon or we could use Cornwall as a rural area that has little change over a long period of time. And then we again link back to the question overall, why does this show that population structures don't vary from place to place? Now you can see thirdly, I've gone back to my positive argument and I've said population structures again do vary and are different in different places. So then you might want to explore rural versus urban areas. You might want to sh show and explain how changes in population are for different reasons in these two places. Again, you could use Russian oligarchs, Newham, Luton, Brick Lane. We've done loads of examples in diverse places to be able to make an argument like this. And then you link back again to the question. And my final paragraph is another on the other hand or however paragraph. And this one, I'm going to argue on the other hand, rural areas do not change much over time. So I want to explain that rural areas change slowly, much more slowly compared to urban areas, particularly with things like ethnicity change and cultural change. They're very limited. You could use evidence from Shefford, your case study, East Devon and Cornwall as rural areas to show that they have not changed very much over time and try to explain the reasons they potentially don't change much over time. And then again, you finally link back to the question and state why this is disagreeing with the statement in the question. And finally, you can see my conclusion at the bottom here and I've started it for you. Based on what I think, I have said overall population structures vary from place to place. So I've agreed with the question there, but the timing of the change depends on the area's characteristics. So I've said, yes, population structures in places do change, but the time element is different depending on the type of area it is, whether it's rural or urban. I've then put underneath that at the bottom here, you can see that you could talk about urban area trends and how generally urban areas change much quicker than rural areas because of specifically the amount of population that is there. I've also put the rural urban continuum down here because this is another, again, I've mentioned it before, a great model you can use for how urban and rural places change over time. Repeat your arguments very briefly. And why have you decided what you have? So basically, you're looking to back up everything you've said and make that decision. That is an example of a 20 mark question for diverse places. And a final example for you, this one is from coasts. So you do not get a 20 mark question for hazards at all. So your next topic that you've done is coasts and that has a 20 mark question in it. So start off with the question. Evaluate the view that hard engineering approaches to coastal management produce more winners than losers. In other words, do you agree that hard engineering creates more winners than losers? Look at the arguments for and against and make a decision. So in our introduction, we'd start off with what hard engineering and coastal management are. We would literally explain what they are. And then we would name the stakeholders we're going to explore. So I have decided I want to explore local residents, tourists, businesses, and the local councils. Now you can see again, I've got my agreeing and on the other hand arguments. So my first agreeing argument is that hard engineering produces winners such as local residents due to erosion management. I then start to explain that erosion management. So I will say about groins and rock armour and I'll also say about sea walls and I'll say how they protect the coastal residents along that coastline. I'm then going to use evidence from one of my case studies to show that those strategies are in place like Holderness or Bangladesh. And then I'm going to link back to the question. And remember, I'm thinking here about why this is relevant and why is it positive overall? How do the locals actually benefit? On the other hand, Residents are also negatively impacted by coastal management. So how are they negatively impacted? So I'm starting to explain their environmental concerns, people being worried about their landscape being spoiled, the view out to the sea, for example, not being as clear as it used to be because there's a sea wall and there's groins and so on. And also you can argue about the environmental impacts of 
changing the natural processes. Again, then you come to your evidence. So Mapleton, for example, has groins and a sea wall that removes the sea views. It's a good piece of evidence you can use specifically from that case study. And again, overall, why is this negative? So why does this produce a loser in the local residence? Now, back to my agreeing or positive argument. So this is my second agreeing argument, and I've put here other winners from coastal management are businesses and tourists. So I'm going to link these two together. So in explaining that, the beach is protected. Obviously, tourist levels remain high, therefore, because the beach remains. Businesses, um, therefore, can increase their custom because more and more tourists visit the area and so on. I'm going to link that, obviously, to economic and social benefits, therefore. Now, for evidence for this, you could use, for example, Walton on the Nays. And you could say how coastal management in Walton on the Nays protects the tower and the town as well as the pier, which attracts lots of tourists and has lots of businesses. And then you would link back to the question then at the end with why that's relevant, why that's a positive argument, why they are winners. And finally, on the other hand, last paragraph with our arguments, I'm going to say, however, another loser from hard engineering are local councils. And I'm then going to explain what I mean by that. So shoreline plans, shoreline management plans or SMPs are very expensive. They require support from government. They require centralised funding and uh, they re require the support of locals and businesses. So they require the support of all of the stakeholders in that town. An example that you can use as evidence is Mapleton or Flamborough Head and generally the whole Holderness Coast. There are lots of examples of this in that area. And then again, why is this producing losers in some cases, linking back to the question. Finally, the all important conclusion. I have started my conclusion off and I have said overall, hard engineering coastal management does create more winners than losers, especially economically and socially. So I have decided that based on what I've said, yes, there are more winners than losers in hard engineering approaches. Now, you may decide that there are more losers. That's fine. It doesn't matter so long as you can explain why you have decided that in your conclusion. So I've said there that local residents benefit mainly, businesses benefit and tourists benefit. There are boosts economically and socially from hard engineering along a coastline. And then you just briefly repeat your arguments and that's it. That is your 20 mark question answered. So hopefully you found those two examples for 20 mark questions useful. And I'm just going to scoot on now to the final thing we're going to do. And that is a roundup repeat of all of those main points I've just made. So provide an introduction, outline the key terms, define what your arguments are. Debate and discuss the issues and arguments. Give agreeing and disagreeing views or opposing views. Have two paragraphs that are in favour or support or provide advantages and have two paragraphs of on the other hand or however which provide disadvantages or opposing views. And finally that all important end bit come to a conclusion or a judgment, make a decision based on all of the arguments you have made. And that is everything I have for you on 12 and 20 mark question structuring and planning to be able to reach those top level three and level four marks for the 12 and 20 mark questions respectively. Hopefully you found this useful. Play it back as much as you wish. Try and use it to help you plan your 12 and 20 mark answers. And if you've got any questions, please do ask your A-level geography teacher and they will be happy to help you.